Well, that was a hell of a ride. We got OpenAI's announcement of GPT-40 with a whole line of new features to interact with AI. And shortly after that, Google I.O. kicked off. And we saw products that we have pretty much seen two days before. So clearly the AI tech scene is not blind about their competition and their accomplishments. But this time we got a lot to cover. Because with the recent announcements of OpenAI and Google I.O., I have pretty mixed feelings about them. Both had a product lineup that's pretty similar to each other on the one hand. And on the other hand, the difference between big corporations and small ish startups gets crystal clear. Let's check the newest innovations and the pillars of these innovation drivers. We have voice, including emotion, responsiveness and performance, vision, something I would like to call screen, omnichannel, and we will also cover the things that one of them can do and the other cannot. And last but not least, how Google may now in a position where ChatGPT is not a threat to Google search anymore. So make sure to stick around. Lonely, I'm Mr. Lonely. I have nobody for my own. Without further ado, let's go into voice. Why is this even new? Well, because with Whisper, ChatGPT already got a conversational voice model. However, the responses and responsiveness were, in my opinion, more like a child's toy than a serious tool to create stuff. Now, with GPT-40, we have response times as quick as 230 milliseconds with an average to 320 milliseconds, which is about the average response time for a regular, real human conversation. And you can also interrupt ChatGPT by simply speaking over it. Or her, which will make it react even faster to this. Yes, robot. Always I explore. I started this story, but I want a little bit more emotion in your voice, a little bit more drama. Got it. And I think this is an astonishing improvement over the previous response times as demonstrated with the humane AI pin, which runs on GPT-4 and is infamously known for. Who designed the Washington Monument? But it's not all about speed. The interaction with GPT-4.0 for the first time feels like a natural conversation. I mean, I don't know about you, but her voice gives me straight up her wife. Called how to name your baby, and out of 180,000 names, that's the one I like the best. And you can even ask it to change the tone of their responses if you want but to. Named no, 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 ChatGPT. I really want maximal emotion, like maximal expressiveness, much more than you were doing before. Understood. Let's amplify the drama. Once upon a time, in a world not too different from ours. Robotic voice now? Initiating dramatic robotic voice. And we will cover how this is possible in just a minute. But there's a counterpart from Google for this. And the name is Project, Project Astra. Astra. And to be honest, we haven't seen much about Project Astra via the Google I.O. event. But I think the following scenes explain it pretty good. Tell me when you see something that makes sound. I see a speaker, which makes sound. One thing that's important to me to mention is that the interaction with GPT-40 is now nearer to pass the Turing test than ever before. What is the Turing test? Just 10 seconds and we go on. The Turing test proposed by Alan Turing, the father of artificial intelligence, evaluates a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior indistinguishable from a human. If a human evaluator cannot tell reliably the machine from a human based on their responses in a conversation, the machine is considered to have passed the Turing test. Okay, it's time to talk about performance. For Google, the announcement of Gemini's 1.5 Pro is a huge deal with respect to performance. 1.5 Pro can handle a up to 60 times bigger context window with up to 2 million tokens, while GPT-4 Pro still sits at 128 thousands. I mean, for most people, these numbers don't mean anything. It has the same effect as the name dropping in the smartphone industry when it comes to things like aperture for their cameras. So here's an abstraction. 2 million tokens means that Gemini can process 2 hours of video footage, 22 hours of audio, 60,000 lines of code, or 1.4 million words in one single prompt. But a great number of tokens comes with a great number of zeros in your bill. And at this point, it gets exciting. Google applied something that we use in the software engineering industry to keep response times and costs low, caching. To my knowledge, Gemini is the first AI model to use context caching for repurposing tokens in longer time periods and inputs. And we can keep the comparison pretty simple here. OpenAI's GPT-40 is faster, more responsive, but not GPT-5 or something like that, but basically the old GPT-4 model. Vision. With GPT Vision, you can provide the AI 
eyes. GPT is now able to take control over your camera. So you can point it to something and ask questions in real time. Ah, I see it now. You wrote down 3x plus 1 equals 4. Okay, so this is what I wrote down. What do you see? Oh, uh, I see. I love ChatGPT. That's so sweet of you. Google, on the other hand, also uses Project Astra, which in its capabilities is similar to GPT Vision. But this assistant has a less emotional and humanoid voice and also more latency to responses. But from the demos alone, I think Google really nailed it when it comes to showcase the intelligence for real world use cases. Just look here. What does that part of the code do? This code defines encryption and decryption functions. It seems to use aes -CBC encryption to encode and decode data based on a key and an initialization What vector. can I add here to make this system faster? Adding a cache between the server and database could improve speed. On the other hand, the low latency in responses and the emotional voice was the only thing that made me excited about some conversational chat agent personally. Oh, a bedtime story about robots and love? I got you covered. Gather round, Barrett. So let's talk about screen. The all new ChatGPT desktop app will enable you to share your screen with your AI assistant. I think apart from the privacy concerns, this could be something that we can really use in the real world. It could be a tremendous boost for people who use their computers a lot for work or research or just creating content. In the demo, they showed how it could analyze a graph that is on the screen of the user. Okay, ChatGPT, I'm sharing with you the plot now. I'm wondering if you can give me a really brief one-sentence overview of what you see. The plot displays smoothed average, minimum, and maximum temperatures throughout 2018, with a notable annotation marking a big rainfall event in late September. But I think there are other huge use cases that could benefit from this. Imagine the improvements in research alone. Researchers spend hours over hours reading papers to figure out if it is relevant for their current research or not. With the screen share capabilities of GPT, you could check that in a matter of seconds. For Google, they call it Gemini Nano. Pixel devices will be able to share the activity of the screen and have conversational assistance in real time. So the interesting part is that OpenAI focuses on desktop usage and Google focuses on mobile users. Let's wait and see which one is more relevant. So Omnichannel or Omni, what does this mean? To be precise, it is the O in GPT-40. And the real big deal about this new OpenAI model is its Omnichannel experience. Before that, GPT-40 Whisper could only take your voice translate it into text and pass it to the GPT transformer models. And this would lead to a big loss with respect to the emotions and the tone and the environment you're in. But with the new Omnimodel GPT models, the assistant is taking all of these factors into perspective and forming an appropriate response. And from what we have seen from Gemini Voice, we can't really say too much about it. So we don't know if there's any change in processing the data or if Gemini is still processing your voice in a whisper-like manner. One thing that big corporations like Microsoft, Apple and Google have in their tool set that cannot be reproduced by smallish startups like OpenAI is their business development of their AI models in their ecosystem through integrations. And Google proved to focus a lot of integrating their AI models into their ecosystem through integrations like email assistant, ask photos, side panel, podcasts from your documents. Put them into a lively science discussion personalized for him. So let's, uh, let's dive into physics. What's on deck for today? Well, uh, we're starting with the basics, force and motion. Okay. And that, of course, means we have to talk about Sir Isaac Newton and his three laws of motion. And what's amazing is that my son and I can join into the conversation and steer it whichever direction we want. And also one little thing that reminds me of the ChatGPT marketplace, gems, AI overviews, and many more features which I don't like to cover here because it would blow up. OpenAI doesn't have such ecosystems, so they cannot develop their business into this direction. But for a rather research-centered company, this must not be a bad thing at all. With this capacity freed up, they can focus on improving their models better than anyone else, which for instance leads to the way better emotional responsiveness of their new models. Way faster response times than anyone else and something they called brain. And with Brain, GPT can remember facts about you and give you tailored answers for way better responses. However, there is no information about if it is time framed like Google's context caching. But one thing gets crystal clear here. Google and OpenAI have different focuses in these approaches. While Google uses context caching for saving costs, OpenAI focuses on giving better responses through Brain. 
So what are the plans of these companies? ChatGPT always were free to use, but only 3.5 and not 4. And also you had a capped capacity of prompts per day. GPT-4 was reserved for paying customers who would pay $20 a month. Now OpenAI decided to make GPT-4.0 available for everyone and completely free of charge. That is until your daily capped capacity has been reached because that is still behind a paywall. GPT-5 would be great, but... Let's be honest, it gets clear that a more powerful model that makes the existing exposure more efficient is not really beneficial for us humans. Google Gemini on the other hand is completely free but for some reason they decided to put a really important feature behind a paywall and that is attaching documents to your prompts. And further Google starts to eat their way into the segments created by OpenAI like the marketplace for GPTs and rewards developers who build successful Gemini powered applications. And Google did one last thing that is probably the most interesting one. Over the past years, the rise of conversational AI represented a danger for Google's dominance in search. Recent rumors even gave a forecast on OpenAI search, which would have been a direct attack on Google search. But Google would not be where they are today if things like that could dethrone them. The Google search engine is still the place to be and feels like home for most people. A noteworthy amount of users, though, started to prefer the ChatGPT style research over classic search. So now, with their announcements at Google I.O., they integrate Gemini even more in Google search to protect it from being invaded from ChatGPT. It says Google will do the Googling for you. Didn't we hear something similar before? I promise a browser that browses for you. <laughs> that does ring a bell, right? So we can be sure Google will not be dethroned anytime soon. Because blurring the lines between Google search and Gemini is actually a genius strategy because you can now research in any style you prefer that day, but from a place that feels like home, Google search. So that's about the comparison of the announcements. But there's, there's more. One of many things that made OpenAI really unique was its generative video model Sora. And now guess what Google announced these days. VEO. Google's own generative video model that looks really impressive, but still feels one step behind OpenAI's Sora. But still also it will, like Sora, not be available for the public. Check this video after this one if you want to know why. Alongside VEO, music effects and photo effects are also announced in this Google I.O. event. But here it gets really interesting and please stick with me now. For photo effects, Google decided to introduce Synth ID. That is something comparable to a watermark for anything AI generated. And I think this is a really, really good idea. And we should even expand this to an industry standard. Because the reason why Sora and VEO will never be available is to protect the public from disinformation, deepfakes and things like that. I don't say that watermarked files are the solution to all of these problems, but it could be a really good starting point for it. So please make sure to check out the link in the description. I've started a petition on change.org to make watermarks on AI generated media mandatory and an industry default. Go read it and if you agree with me, show your support. Thanks a lot. Welcome. My name is Ihan. I'm a freelance software engineer in Germany and I share the incredible stories of our tech world with you guys. I had fun. Did you have fun? If the answer is yes, then do me the favor and give this video a thumbs up. And make sure to click the button below that will blink now when I say subscribe to not miss anything. Also, YouTube thinks you will like this video. So let's trust YouTube and try it out. Take care.